13-week theater is supported by Patreon. Subscribe now and get exclusive early access. In 1931, author Thorne Smith released the novel Turnabout, where a jealous, bickering young married couple have their bodies switched by an ancient Egyptian artifact. Hilarity ensues as the husband has to fend off his wife's former lover, and the wife has to adapt to the high-pressure business of advertising. The story peaks when the couple switch back, only to discover that the husband is now pregnant. Remembering how big a hit an earlier novel by Smith called Topper had been as a movie franchise, producer Hal Roach of Our Gang fame bought the rights and put out a movie adaptation in 1940 starring Adolf Manjou and Carol Landis. Are you sure you want to change places? Why? Yes, I'd like it. I'd like it. I know I would. Well... That's good enough for me. Now, you're on your own. And don't forget, you asked for it. Oh, Tim, it really happened. Ah, uh, go on back to sleep. It's just a nightmare. We both just wanted to tell you how much we appreciate all you've done for us, Mr. Rand. You've made us the happiest people on earth, honestly. Oh, Sally, sweetheart, do you feel all right? Oh, I feel fine. Come here. I made a terrible mistake. Listen. You mean that I... Oh. Jimmy! Oh. Oh. Ah. Willow! Oh, what? Oh. Jimmy! Jimmy, what's the matter? Oh, Willow, oh, Mr. Willow, what's the matter, Jimmy. partner? Oh, what's the matter? matter? is going to have a baby. <laughs> the male pregnancy angle riled censorship boards and kept the movie out of the better theaters, but the audiences loved it, and it eventually became a cult classic. In 1978, producer Stephen Boschko was in a bit of a slump. A story editor for hits like Ironside, Columbo, and Macmillan and Wife for Universal Television, Boschko's most recent projects had been uh, less than successful. Discovering the Hal Roach film and remembering that Topper had also been a TV hit, Boschko decided that a modern take on Turnabout had potential. He co-wrote a pilot with writer Jim Rogers, adapting the screenplay from the 1940 film. Instead of an ad executive, Boschko made the husband Sam a sports writer, thinking that the idea of a woman in men's locker rooms, even in a man's body, had potential. The wife, Penny, went from being a housewife to a cosmetics executive, a job where it was felt that a man, even in a woman's body, would be over his head. For Sam, Boschko tapped his friend from his Macmillan and wife days, John Shuck, who'd been having career problems of his own, but that's another story. And for Penny, he tapped actress Sharon Gless, who was just coming off the Eddie Albert Robert Wagner detective series, Switch. in the living room? No. <laughs> How much is he? Forty dollars. Forty dollars? Hey, it comes with a legend. How much without the legend? <laughs> What's the legend? The ancients say that under certain conditions, the owner of that statue will be granted a wish. What are the conditions? And the sun, the moon, and the stars are at one with the hearts of the believers. The legend will come true. Now, what is that supposed to mean? That part's a little fuzzy. Well, I don't pay 40 bucks for fuzz. <laughs> I don't care. I want it. I love you, old chum. 
I really do. I love you too, pal. I'm sorry I was such a lump today. That's okay. Don't worry. Things will seem better in the morning. Yeah. Still, I wish we could change places with each other. produced a pilot which received lukewarm reception from the networks. Until, that is, it crossed the desk of Fred Silverman. Silverman, who had recently taken over as the head of NBC, saw potential in the comedy. Plus, he was desperate for anything that would lift NBC out of fourth place in the three-network world. Silverman greenlit the show, ordering seven episodes to serve as a mid-season replacement. Once upon a time, in a very nice city, in a very nice house, there lived a very nice man and a very nice woman. They were married to each other and they loved each other very much. They not only loved each other, they also liked each other. How about that? But they had a problem. Even though they loved each other and liked each other and had good jobs, they sometimes were not very happy. They envied each other. They each thought the other one had a more interesting life, and they wished they could change places with each other. And they said that. Unfortunately, they said it in front of a statue that had a magic spell. And lo and behold, his spirit and personality went into her body and hers went into his. And that's the way they are today. Will they live happier ever after? Well, let's see. The show debuted on Friday, January 26th, 1979. And to help give the show a boost, Silverman used it as the lead-in to what he was certain was going to be a surefire hit for NBC. And sometimes things get too hot to handle. Then it's Hello Larry. Now, maybe hindsight is 2020, but it's kind of hard to imagine that no one saw the writing on the wall. The writing for the show was, well, let's call it pedestrian containing every cheap joke that could be milked out of the situation and every body swap trope that had been done to death by this point. The cheapness of the gags were accentuated by direction, which had Sharon Gless playing the role as butch as humanly possible and John Shuck adding just a little bit of a mince to his movements. Where's my sausage? No more sausages, Sam. You forgot it upsets my stomach. Besides, now that you're wearing my body, you're only allowed 1,200 calories for the whole day. Penny, the ice in the butter of my drink says how many calories in. Come on, I gotta go. 
I think I may die. Please, God, make it a heart attack. Then it'll be over fast. It's terrific, huh? Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, thank you. Did you see me last week? Okay. Of course we saw the game. <laughs> Sam, don't you think Randy has the best pair of hands in football? I hadn't noticed. To learn from, from a voice of experience exactly what it feels like to have a baby. Oh, I sure would. All right. Now, now put down your purse. Now... Now take these two fingers and and hold your upper lip. Now now squeeze. Tighter. This is what the pain supposed to feel like? Almost. Now pull the lip over your head. <laughs> it also didn't help that most people who were watching a new show that night opted for one on CBS. Waylon Jennings tells the story of the Dukes of Hazard starting Friday, January 26th. The writing on the wall had become a neon sign. The ratings never really recovered and NBC aired all seven episodes, including one which involved the statue being stolen and could have worked as a cliffhanger. But in the end, there would be no cliffhanger, not even a cliff to hang off of. NBC let Turnabout fade away quietly, deciding against ordering another season. In hopes of trying to recoup some of their loss, Universal re-edited four episodes of the show, including the original pilot, into a TV movie called The Magic Statue. It did just about as well as the TV series did. A few years after Turnabout, Sharon Gless finally became a big star co-starring in Cagney and Lacey. John Schock went on to play just about every bit part television could offer him, plus a successful run on the stage. And Stephen Boschko? Well, he left Universal for MTM, where he finally landed a huge hit of his own with Hill Street Blues. He also went on to create such hits as NYPD Blue, Dookie Hauser, MD, and... Wednesdays this fall, Stephen Boschko's Cobb Rock. Uh, well, that's another story. Stay tuned now for Hello Larry, starring McLean Stevenson. He's a radio talk show host who's a whiz on the air, but he still gets plenty of static at home from two teenage daughters. Then see the premiere of Sweepstakes with the thrilling stories of the winners and losers of a million-dollar lottery. Sunday night, don't miss the Bob Hope special with Debbie and Pat Boone, Sammy Davis Jr., and Debbie Reynolds. Bob Hope, after Centennial, Sunday on NBC. Monkey. Monkey.